Well, if you're uh, new to our church today, let me just say that uh, we welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus. So glad that you're here today. Uh, I think my mic is on back here. Just going to give you a heads up. Uh, and let me also say that if you're new to our church, one of, we typically work our way through the books of the Bible. We've been working our way through the Gospel of Matthew for some time, but we took a break a few weeks ago uh, to do a series on the church. And so every week we've been talking about some aspect related to the local church. And so week one, we looked at uh, what is the church and who is the church. And then in week two, we looked at the mission of the church. In week three, we looked at the worship of the church. And then last week, Chris uh, wonderfully taught us on the ordinance of baptism. And today we're going to look at part one of the organization of the church. This is going to be a part one uh, kind of sermon. And uh, there's so much here to cover. I, I, I you know, cut, cutting and cutting and cutting uh, to make it somewhat manageable. There's so much more that could be said, but uh, we're just going to dive right in. But before we do, let's have prayer together. Father, we thank you once again for the privilege to look at your word, to read your word, to study it, to uh, give us grace to understand it, to embrace it. Uh, Lord Jesus, help us to, to be a people that follow all of your teachings. Uh, not just the ones that we read in the Gospels that are in red letters and some people think that somehow that's greater than the rest of Scripture. No, it's all from you. Help us to follow all that your word says with all our heart. Give me grace, Lord, to faithfully teach your word now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, back in uh, 1967, when Paul Newman was acting and not making salad dressings, he, he was in this movie called called Cool Hand Luke. Anybody remember that movie? Yeah, cool Hand Luke? yeah. yeah that's a really good movie. And uh, he played the role, if you're not familiar with it, he played the role of a nonconformist, somebody who would just not submit to the rules. And so in the movie, he's just constantly bucking authority, and the, the authorities there, they press harder and harder against him. And then you get to that, I think probably the most memorable line in the movie, when the uh, captain or, or the warden who gets really angry with him, just, just socks him right side of the head and knocks it down to the ground. And he says that famous line, quote, what we've got here is failure to <laughs> communicate. I love that line. That reminds me of an incident early in the early days of my ministry when I had a, a sort of a head-to-head -head meeting. Uh, this was a long time ago, another church, but it was a head-to-head -head meeting with a uh, some of the leaders, and some of the leaders in that church, in fact, they were deacons, said to me very plainly and very clearly, look, we hired you to do weddings and do funerals and preach, and you leave everything else up to us. I mean, they said it that bluntly. And what rang through my head in that moment was this line from Paul Newman's movie, what we have here is failure to communicate. Well, what I hope to do this morning is to clarify what the Scripture says about the local church and its organization. And so today, uh, you'll notice the outline has four parts to it here. I'm going to go ahead and just give it all to you because I know some of you are going to be like, oh, I can't have my outline to not be fully filled in. So if there's one idea, if there's one thesis that, that in this message today and next week, it's simply this. Uh, under Jesus' Lordship... The local church is led by pastors, served by deacons, and governed by its members. It is under Jesus' lordship, the local church is led by pastors, served by deacons, and governed by its members. And so uh, we're going to look at, in this outline, if you want to go ahead and fill this in, uh, Jesus has ultimate authority and is the head of the church. He has ultimate authority and is the head of the church. And pastors, they teach lead, pray, and shepherd God's people. They teach, lead, and pray, and shepherd God's people. All right? So we'll come back to that. Let's go back to the top there. And Actually, I'll just make you wait on the, the other two points. It's just the anticipation will just eat you alive, I know, over the whole week. So let's go back to this top point. Jesus has ultimate authority and is the head of the church. Let me share with you some verses kind of to get us started here. Uh, and by the way, keep your Bibles open because we're going to be in the book of Titus in a few moments. I've got sort of a, a, a long introduction. The bulk of the message, though, will be under point number two. But I want us to, to kind of lay the foundation here as we talk about Jesus being the head of the church. So here's some verses to get us started. Uh, Ephesians 1, 22 through 23. And he put all things under his feet 
and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Or how about this one? For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is Savior. That's Ephesians 5, verse 23. Or Colossians 1, 17 and 18. He is before all things, talking about Jesus here, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. And then finally, Colossians 2, 9 and 10. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness of Christ who is the head over every power and authority. So authority. This defines who Jesus is in relation to this world and into the church. He stands above all things. He's supreme above all powers. The living, the dead, the rich, the powerful, angelic and demonic, kings, presidents, dictators. He is the sovereign ruler of the universe who holds all things together. So do you think the world's falling apart? It certainly feels like it right now, doesn't it? Look, especially at least with our country, it's like, man, I don't know if we're going to make it another four years. I don't know if we'll be, if we even be a country 20, 50 years from now. Listen, the world is not going to fall apart, not entirely, because Christ is holding it together. And not only is he holding this universe together, he's also the head of his church. So what does it mean to say that Christ is head of his church? Well, if you look up the Greek meaning there of that word head, it has two meanings. So one meaning is literally it refers to this thing on top of your shoulders, your head. All right? So it can literally mean the head on your shoulders, but metaphorically, it means something different. It means authority. It means leadership. Uh, Wayne Grudem, who's a theologian, did a comprehensive study on this Greek word for head, and he found that it overwhelmingly carries the meaning of authority. He examined, get this, 2,336 examples of it in ancient Greek, from Homer in the 8th century all the way through the church fathers up in the 4th century. 12,000 years uh, of it in total. And here's what he said, quote, Never did it have any other meaning than governing, ruling authority, unless the context clearly indicated otherwise. And you might think, okay, what's the point of all this, Wes? This seems pretty, pretty obvious, and and I suppose that you're not going to find a church out there, maybe one or two, I don't know, maybe a few more. But you're not going to find a lot of people that are going to argue the idea that Christ is the head of his church. But let me suggest to you that many churches, in their practices, their doctrines, and their, their ministries, do not reflect Christ's agenda. They don't reflect the truth. They lay aside his words. They lay aside his vision, his agenda for their own. And so what, what might a church be about? What, what might an average church in this community be about? Well, it might be about social justice. It might be about environmentalism. It might be about a political agenda, pick your party. It could be uh, focused on esoteric experiences. You know, one of the things that I've heard people say sometimes is, well, church was so great this morning, the pastor never even got to preach. The, quote, the Holy Ghost came down and, and we just had lots of worship. It might be simply about cherished traditions, that famous line we've all heard, quote, we've always done it that way. At the end of the day, the point is this, something is more important to churches, of some churches at least, than the mission of the will of Christ. So to say that Christ is the head of the church, it's more than just a statement, it's a commitment. It's a commitment on the part of our church to reflect that reality in our doctrines, our decisions, and in our teaching, everything that we say and everything we do should align, should be in conformity with God's word. But let me also suggest to you that Christ is not only the head of the church corporately, which is true, but also individually. He is guiding and directing each believer in their walk with him. So there's an obvious question we ought to have. Then. If Christ is, is not just the head of this church, but he's the head of my life if I'm a believer, then how do I know that? How do I know if, if, if I'm living in a way that reflects Christ's headship in my life, well, look at what you do. That's your answer. Look at what you do. In Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus looked out at the crowd, and here's what he said to them. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do 
what I said. The single most obvious way to see if you're living your life like Jesus is the head of it is in your obedience to his teachings. A few years ago when I was in Texas with Julie Ann, of course, this was, uh, gosh, I don't know, 2017, something like that, maybe later, we took a tour of Cowboy Stadium. I refuse to call it anything else. <laughs> the most glorious stadium in football. <laughs> and on that, I hear you. And on that tour, we went down into the, the, the player's locker, locker room. And it was really cool. You, you could walk around and look at things. You could take pictures. You could pretty much go everywhere, except there was this, there were a couple of lockers that were off limits. They had like, you know when you go to the movies, those little ropes that you can't walk past that block off the section? They had those in front of their lockers. It was like, you could see every player's locker. You could go up and touch them, except for just these couple here, these, these high dollar players. I guess they thought they were a little more special. But it made me think about how we sometimes treat Christ as head of our lives. We broke off areas from him. Jesus, you're, you're welcome in every area of my life except this one area. This area is roped off. It's off limits to you. I'll take your promises. Thank you for your blessings. I'm grateful for your help in, in this time of crisis in my life. I'll give you credit on Facebook and on Twitter uh, and on Instagram. But, but listen, can you just kind of look the other way about this one thing in my life? Ask yourself right now, is there an area of your life that you're compromising? You know it's wrong. You know deep in your soul it's not right. It's not in conformity with Jesus' teaching, but you, you do it anyway. Listen to me. If there's an area of your life that you're living your own way, no matter what you say, Christ, you're not living as though Christ is the head of your life. And let me add this too. There's a direct connection between a church that rejects Christ's authority and the spiritual condition of its members. So if a church is not fully submitted to Christ's authority in its doctrines, its decisions, its teaching, its members will likely reflect that submission in their own lives. And you'll see that the choices they make, you'll, you'll, you'll observe it in the worldviews that, that they adopt. John Calvin said it well. He said, Christ is the only head of the church. And it is a treason against him to assign this honor to any other. That's a good word. Now, the rest of our time, we're going to spend on this second point, and that is about pastors. So we've established that Christ is the true head of the church. It's not a pastor. It's not a group of pastors. It's not the deacons. It's not you, the congregation. It's Christ. But let's talk about pastors. And what do pastors do in the local church? Well, they teach, lead, pray, and shepherd God's people. Teach, lead, pray, and shepherd God's people. In the New Testament, there are two church leadership offices. There's pastor and there's deacon. And sometimes the office uh, of pastor is referred to as simply pastor. Sometimes it's referred to in the New Testament as overseer. Or if you have the old King James Version, it's bishop. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as elder. So this is a little confusing to us on the surface, but it's not as bad as it sounds. So let me just say this. You would be perfectly fine to call Chris or me your overseer or your elder. But I think culturally speaking, the term pastor has just kind of been more popular usage. And I'm fine with that as well. Now, again, it can be confusing to people, but the, these different terms are used interchangeably in the New Testament for the same office. What they do is they, they show or represent, they emphasize different areas of responsibility for the, for the, the pastor. So let me tell you a little bit about them. Pastor here, it highlights the role of shepherd. So the pastor is the one who cares for the, the spiritual needs of, of God's people. He's dedicated to feeding God's people his word. Remember what Jesus said to Peter? He said, do you love me? And what did Jesus, and Peter said, yes, you know I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Right? He's talking about feeding God's people God's word. The other word for, for what I do is called elder. And for what Chris does is elder. That's a word that if you read your Bibles, in the Old Testament, the elder was sometimes, the, the, they were the wise guys that sat outside the gate and people consulted with them. But in the context of the New Testament, uh, it doesn't have to do with your age but rather one spiritual maturity. It, it, it's referring to a position, an office. And so the elder is a spiritually mature believer. 
And then that third word there, overseer, or, or as it's sometimes referred to in older translations, bishop, this is not an elevated position among the clergy, as we sometimes see in, in denominations. Although I have to admit, Bishop Taylor does have a nice ring to it. And I won't be opposed to it if you want to call me that. No, seriously. Um, sometimes you see this. Uh, I was a part of a denomination years ago, and, they, and the bishop was the top guy in the denomination. And that's not what it refers to. It, it really refers to the managing or the, the overseeing the aspects of, the governing aspects of church leadership. It's about the overall direction of the church and its doctrinal integrity. So if I could kind of summarize what I've said so far, it would be this, that the pastor is called to shepherd, lead, and administrate the church. And, and in practice, these roles, they're going to overlap. So since this is their role, uh, and, and since this is what we've been called to do, we've been given a, a measure of authority in the church, and members are supposed to acknowledge that and submit to that. So for example, we read in Hebrews 13, verse 17. I'm going to share a lot of scripture, and I just encourage you to jot it down and look it up later. Here's what we read. The writer of Hebrews, talking about the pastors of the church, he says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Stop. Who are they giving an account to? Some denominational leader? Are they giving an account to the personnel committee or the deacons? No, he's talking about God. They give an account to God. I'd much rather be accountable to the personnel committee or the deacons, <laughs> frankly. He says, let, he goes on to say, they, give, they are men who have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, this may be a shock to you, no pastor is perfect. <laughs> but if you have good pastors who love Jesus and faithfully lead you and try to be a godly example to you, you should earnestly and gladly follow their leadership, whether you're a member of this church or whether you're visiting from another church. And this authority, yes, can it be abused? Sure. We've all seen bad pastors out there. Uh, I've always been amazed. There's two pastors. I won't say who they are. But there are two pastors that serve long-term on this peninsula. And when I hear, I always ask the members about these two pastors. The one pastor who served, they're both, by the way, these men are dead. The one pastor, I mean, it's almost unanimous. Almost 100% of people say, oh, what a godly man he was. And what a great pastor he was. And it's almost 100% the opposite direction for the other long-tenured pastor who served at a different church. I asked about that man in their life who was retiring. It was his way or the highway. He was, he, was, uh, he was rude. You know, he was pugnacious, as we used to say. This authority can be abused, and it should never be. And Peter writes to the elders of his day, urging them to not do this. Listen to what he says in 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, not because you got to do it, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So that's a powerful instruction that every pastor needs to hear, myself at the top of that list. Now, all of this may be new to you. Perhaps you have come from a, a church or a denomination that has a, a hierarchical form of government. You might have had a superintendent over your church. You, you might uh, have had uh, a, a bishop that was over a region of churches in your area, and he could come in and tell you this or that. Or you, maybe you come from a Roman Catholic background where you've got priests and archbishops and bishops and cardinals and popes. You know, but if you go and you read the New Testament, you will not find these kinds of structures. In fact, let me just say this. The hierarchical form of government is something that gradually develops over the history of the church, contrary to the scriptures. Instead, what you see in the Bible is that in the New Testament, there are two offices, pastor and deacon, and churches are independent, autonomous, self-governing bodies. Now, even if you're a Southern Baptist here this morning, you've been one your whole life, and you say, well, hold on, Wes. I've never heard anybody mention this word elder until you came along. I've never even heard anybody talk about it. And, and I understand that. But if you were to actually take time to look into your church's history, you would see that it's there. So, um, they're reflected in our statement of faith, the Baptist faith in essence. Let me give you a, a very brief history lesson. You know I like these. In 1853, 
uh, there was a thing called the New, ba ba New, New Hampshire Baptist Confession. So the Baptist faith in essence, our statement of faith, was largely uh, influenced, uh, developed by the New, from the New Hampshire Baptist Confession. And so if you look there under the doctrine of the church, here's what it says about the office or positions within the local church. We're going to put this on the screen for you. Do we have it up there? Good. So, 1853 New Hampshire Baptist Confession, its only scriptural offices are bishops or pastors and deacons. By the way, bishop and pastor mean same thing, two different names. Right? And then, we developed the Baptist faith and message off of that the New Hampshire Baptist Confession. The first version of that statement of faith comes out in 1925. Look what it says. Its scriptural offices, same article for the church here, but scriptural offices are bishops or elders, same word, uh, same, a different word, same office, and deacons. And then we had a, a, a revision of it in 1963, and they, they updated the language, and it says the scriptural offices are pastors and deacons, which, again, that, that word probably more accurately reflects our culture. But then in 2000, uh, we changed some things again, and, and the latest version to make it clearer is the scriptural offices are that of pastor, elder, overseer, and deacon. To bring greater clarity. Because even after all these years, some people are still confused on this point. So I just bring that up to you so you can kind of see that at a glance. Now for the remaining minutes, let's look at a New Testament passage that specifically addresses the pastor, elders, and overseers and their qualifications. So if you have your Bibles, would you take those now, keep them open, and let's turn to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Let me give a little background to this passage as you're turning there. The, the letter of Titus is one of the, the pastoral epistles written to a, a, a pastor and elder named Titus. Uh, these pastoral epistles were written late in Paul's ministry. And uh, his ministry is coming to an end. He has been on multiple missionary journeys. He's planted a number of churches. And so there's probably some things on his mind like how will these young churches continue to grow and mature once he's moved to another <laughs> geographic location, or even greater than that, now he's in prison, what's going to happen to these churches after he dies? So this is a great concern for the Apostle Paul as he writes to Titus. And Paul needed to prepare young leaders like Titus and, and Timothy to take over this pioneering work. So how would this be accomplished? How could he ensure that these local churches would continue to thrive and stay faithful to the gospel? How would they be protected from false teachers, from wolves who come in and ravish the people? Paul's answer is to appoint elders. The elders would shepherd, lead, and protect the churches. So, let's look together at Titus chapter 1. Let's look at verses 5 through 9. He says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order, and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-control, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly, firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict. Amen. So... I want to just make, like, I'd love to do a deep dive into this passage, but we don't have time. So I'm going to just draw out a few observations this morning. And then next week, if we talk about deacons, I'll probably refer back to pastors and try to fill in a little bit of the, the maybe some holes that uh, in, in our thinking that we're, we're not going to cover today. But let me give you observation number one from this text. And that is that pastors bring order to the church. Pastors bring order to the church. The word there in verse 5 for order has to do with arranging things. It's a, it was actually a medical term in that day for setting a bone. So it possibly denotes that some things had gotten out of order since Paul had left. But more likely, uh, more likely it, it, it refers to the church being under threat of false teachers. In fact, if you go down, we don't have time to look at it, but you go down to verses 10 through 16, and Paul warns about the circumcision party. He talks about Cretans who come in and abuse the people and and uh, take advantage of them. He has a concern here about what's happening or what potentially might happen to these young churches. Young church plants are vulnerable. They tend to attract the wrong kinds of people. You say, well, that sounds harsh.
harsh. What I mean by that is they tend to attract false teachers. The first church I was a part of was a church plant. And I understand this very well. We attracted some people in those early days that had really bad theology and really bad agendas. I mean, looking back, I honestly, I mean, I was 22. Uh, the other, the, the pastor was 26. I mean, we did the best we could. And I wish that uh, we had been firmer in dealing with some of those people because that's what young churches and older churches need. They need strong pastoral leadership. So Paul's answer for putting these churches in order is to appoint elders. They will serve the people well, which brings me to observation number two, and that is the church is ideally, and I say ideally, served with multiple pastors. Each local church is ideally served with multiple pastors. Notice that Paul instructs Titus here to appoint elders, plural, in every town. Now, at first glance, you might think he's saying that each church should have an elder, that is, one pastor. But that's really not the case. He's saying appoint elders in each of the churches. How do we know that? Well, the New Testament model uh, for the local church is that each church would be shepherded, led, and governed by a plurality of elders. The, the idea that there are multiple pastors serving in the local church. Why do I say that? Because that's the clear pattern in the New Testament. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders in every church, Acts 14.23. In Acts 11.30, we read elders at the church in Antioch. In Acts chapter 15, verse 2, and 16, verse 4, we, we see elders at the church in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 20, there are elders and overseers at the church of Ephesus. In Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, the church of Philippi has overseers and deacons. In James chapter 5, verse 14, he addresses the elders of the church. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5, Verses 1 and 2, he speaks, he speaks to the elders among you. So again, the biblical model for, for the local church is a group of pastors leading and serving the local church. So you think, well, why would that be? What would be the strength of that approach? Well, let me suggest to you a few things, and this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but uh, it safeguards the church against the idea of abusive authority. Whereas one pastor might be abusive, when there are multiple pastors there, there's a, there's a check and balance. It also brings greater balance overall to pastoral ministry, helping to compensate for one, one pastor's weaknesses. <clears throat> one pastor's not good at everything. I mean, whether we're talking about me or any of the other pastors you have, there's not one man that's ever served your church and you went, that guy is the total package, he's perfect in every area. I mean, it would be nice if that were true, but the reality is, is that multiple elder, elders on a church staff help to, to fill in for the weaknesses of the one pastor. It also provides greater accountability. Mutual accountability helps leaders, uh, helps prevent leaders from falling into sin. It increases wisdom in our leadership in the ordinary seasons of life, but especially in those times of crises. It ensures healthy transitions for a church. Think about when a pastor leads. What's better? For you to just go and put together a search committee and go, well, let's find some guy we've never met, haven't spent any time with whatsoever from another state or another country and bring him in to shepherd us. Or if we have multiple pastors on staff, it might be that we pick one of these guys because we know him. We've examined his life. We've seen his character. We know his doctrine. We know his, his qualifications. Let me finally just say it, it ensures that the body of Christ is more effectively served overall. Now, what kinds of qualities should you look for in pastors? Should, should it be that they have a dynamic personality, silver tongue communicator? Should it be their charisma? Or as young people like to say, they got riz? Should it be someone who supports their, did I use that word? Yeah. <laughs> should it be somebody that, that just, you know, supports their traditions, their pet issues? Doesn't, you know, we want somebody to come in here and doesn't change things too much? Should that be the motivation? No, none of that. In a word, or perhaps two words, we should look for men who are above reproach, above reproach. 
you have your Bible still open, I'm down in verse 6. Which brings me to observation number 3 from this passage. Paul tells Titus, choose men who are above reproach to be your pastors. Choose men who are above reproach to be your pastors. The New Testament addresses the qualifications here of pastors or elders here and also in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7. And comparing the, these lists, they are largely sim similar, emphasizing character, family life, doctrinal integrity. But there are a few differences in emphasis and wording. And I wish I had, again, more time to go into both passages. But I think if you look at both of them, the overarching principle between both passages is that the, the pastor is to be above reproach. Now, that does not mean blameless. That does not mean a pastor is to be a perfect man or a sinless man. If that's the case, all men and all, pe all people anywhere across the world would be out of the running. Uh, it's a man that strives to live his life holy in the sight of God and man. There's nothing in him that stands out as... As a disqualifier, he has a good reputation in the church and in the community. And according to the text here, you're to be uh, an elder, whether it's me or Chris or whoever we hire here, is to be blameless or above reproach in three realms his home, his character, his doctrine. So let's look at these very, very quickly this morning in the remaining minutes that we have. An elder must be blameless in the home, he is to be the husband, you'll notice, of one wife. The husband of one wife. That does not mean a single man cannot be a pastor. Uh, the issue is moral character, not marital status. Let me, with that being said, I do think that divorce is generally, and probably in most cases, a disqualifier for a pastor. I think there could be some exceptions to that. I've known pastors who have gotten unbiblical divorces, uh, irreconcilable differences, uh, adultery on the part of the pastor. And then they've gotten remarried. And sometimes they've gotten remarried, and they've gotten remarried, and they've gotten remarried again. And such a man is disqualified from pastoral ministry. I'm sorry, but there's no other way I think you can see that in Scripture. Such a man has disqualified himself from serving as a pastor. But what if he gets results? It doesn't matter. What Scripture says is what Scripture says. And so, uh, uh, you know, unbiblical divorces, yes. Not. Now, could you make a case for maybe a situation where a pastor has been cheated on, his wife cheated on him and left him, and, and, and he could be a pastor again? I think he could. Yeah, I would take that, that position. But I think, again, those would be on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think the, 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 the big picture here that Paul's getting at is that an elder is to be a man of singular affection. He's the man of, that's devoted in heart and action to his wife. He has a track record of faithfulness in marriage. And let me just add this too, since, uh, and I don't have time to address this, but I will address this. Uh, I do believe the New Testament teaches that the office of pastor or elder is limited only to men who meet the biblical qualifications. Now, again, I don't have time to address that. I know that's a sticking point for some of, some of you folks here. We've talked about it before. Uh, but I'm just going to tell you what I believe the scripture says on this point, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Notice also here the qualifications aren't just with, with his marital step, his uh, his married life, but also his children. Paul says are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Now there's a debate here as to whether Paul is saying that a pastor's children must be Christians or obedient, respectful, and not get an open rebellion. So what's at stake is the children's behavior, I think, not their eternal state, since. God is the one that saves us. I mean, there's no way that I can save my children or my wife or you can save your, your spouse or your children. Uh, this is a longer discussion in which we don't have time, so I'll just kind of give you the, quick, the Cliff Notes version. I think the point of this command, again, is simple. The man who leads as an elder in the church must have a proven example of leadership in his home. So the elder's children in the home are they're orderly, they're obedient, they're not open, they're not in open rebellion. A pastor must lovingly and carefully care for his own family before he can lead the church. As one writer states this, quote, The married pastor is called to leadership in two families, his and God's. And the former is to be the training ground for the latter. And so, to put it plainly, a pastor's life and example should inspire his wife and children to know and love Jesus. Now, 
I don't believe this instruction extends to grown children outside of the home. I think when your kids are outside of your authority and on their own, they do what they do. They have an accountability to God. Some people would say, no, 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 they, that counts for them too. I think that takes it farther than what Paul means here. I think, uh, if I could summarize, George Knight, who, again, a theologian, he says it very well. He says, what must not characterize the children of an elder is immorality and undisciplined rebelliousness. If the children are still at home and under his authority, and he goes on to say, Paul is not asking any more of the elder and his children than is expected of every Christian father and his children. However, only if a man exercises such proper control over his children may he be an elder. I think he's right. But So an elder must be blameless in his family, but also you'll notice in his character here, uh, he uses that term above reproach, and he's focused here on character, and he lists a number of negative characteristics that must be avoided in, in a pastor. The first one there is, uh, I think in verse 7, not arrogant. It's the idea that, that the pastor is not self-willed or proud. He's not the guy that has to have everything his way. He's a servant. He puts others first. He's humble. He's teachable. Not also quick-tempered. He's not a hothead. He's not moody. He's not the kind of guy that you're afraid to go up and talk to. People have told me stories about pastors that are like, oh, I don't want to go talk to him. No, no, that's not, that's not good. He's not the kind of guy that's going to bite your head off and uh, scream at you when he gets angry. He has balanced judgment. He's, he's free from rash anger to, uh, uh, behavior. doesn't mean he doesn't ever have a weak moment. We all have our weak moments. But we're talking about a pattern here. Again, a pattern of behavior. He's not good to He's also not a drunkard, you'll notice. And the point here is not a total, total prohibition against drinking alcohol, since in the scriptures it was clear that people did drink alcohol. Uh, amazingly, to the shock of many Southern Baptists, Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine. And again, contrary to what people try to tell you, that the, the word there is wine, and it means what it says, it's wine. Drunkenness is what's at mind here. It, it, this is... The, the pastor is not a drunkard. Drunkardness is a sin. And being, being a drunkard is, and being persistently drunk is sinful. It ruins the pastor's life, but it also ruins the lives of others around him. And I think by reasonable application, the pastor is to be a man contro not controlled by any substance, whether we're talking about alcohol or drugs, maybe even the wrong kinds of food. The point is that there's nothing that impairs his judgment. He also goes on to give another qualification here, not violent. Again, this is sort of taking that hot temper to the next level. The pastor is not a brawler. He's not somebody that physically assaults people. So uh, a man who abuses his wife or his children is not fit to be a pastor. Pastors are often just at the center of conflict, dealing with criticism, dealing with difficult people in difficult situations, and because of that, they have to have a good temperament. They have to be able to, to, to keep their head in those kinds of situations. Paul goes on to write, though, not only is he not violent, you'll notice he says, not greedy for gain. What he means there is a pastor must not love money. He must not be dishonest with his wealth. It doesn't mean that he can't make a good living. It doesn't even mean he can't be wealthy. He might be an entrepreneur on the side. He might make a lot of money. Paul is a tent maker. Um, that's all fine. It means he works for an eternal reward, not an earthly one. He's not controlled by the love of money, which is the root of all kinds of evil. And then you'll notice, after giving us the not this, not that list, he goes on to virtues here. What are the virtues? Well, he must be hospitable. He must be hospitable. He is a man of the people. He loves his people. He's approachable. He's warm. He, he, he's welcoming. He doesn't mind having people in his home. Uh, I, I remember when I was in college, we, we used to do this. I was in this uh, drama ministry. We had this traveling ministry. We do this big drama play, and then we'd preach. And uh, sometimes it was me, and sometimes it was another brother who would preach. I remember, I can't remember which of us preaching this one night, but we're at this church, and uh, and after the sermon, we had this time of prayer around the front, front of the church. You know, people are here praying. And I mean, this went on for like, I don't know, 25, 35 minutes. And I guess probably 30 minutes after the service, things were kind of slowing down. And uh, I was speaking to one of the leaders. I said, hey, uh, is Pastor you know, Terry still here? And uh, I they were like, no, he left. Like, what do you mean he left? Uh, he left 30 minutes ago. He left as soon as the service was over. I'm like, really? And so I, I inquired about privately about that with, with one of the leaders in the church that I knew. And I said, what's up with Pastor Lee? Like, right as soon as the service was over, not, you know, 
And the service went on for another 30 or 40 minutes. What, what's up with that? And they said, that's just how he is. He, he's not a people person. He, he doesn't talk to us. He doesn't linger. He immediately leaves and just goes home. I'm like, what a shame. What a shameful thing for, for a pastor to do. In this church, and I'm not bragging here, but typically the pastors are some of the last people to leave. Because we are here to minister to you. And that matters. And we, we love our people. Uh, not only that, he is a lover of good. He sets his mind and his affection on things that are good, that are noble, his focus is on things that are morally good. He is, Paul says, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. I'll summarize that really quickly. Right? Self-controlled and disciplined means he's got a balanced life. He keeps his head. Right? He, uh, upright means he, he's fair, he's impartial with dealing with people. Holy means he loves God. He hates sin. So he's blameless in the home, he's blameless in character, and then finally, an elder must be blameless in doctrine. The good news is, this is the shortest in the list here for us to cover. How is an elder blameless in doctrine? Well, but notice Paul says here, he holds firmly to the trustworthy word as it's taught. He's not given to strange teachings or conspiracies. He's not into introducing novel ideas. He doesn't attempt to create a syncretistic sort of Christianity that merges the values of this world with the Christian faith. No, he does teach, he does not teach things contrary to the scriptures. He holds firm what he has been taught. And he does this, Paul says, for a reason. Notice the rest of the verse there. So that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. And also to rebuke those who contradict it. If a pastor is not a man of the word, he will not know sound doctrine. He will not be able to refute it. A biblical pastor is one who does not add to the word or take away from it. He clings to it. And he faithfully proclaims it. Again, John Calvin, I think, is helpful here. He says a leader ought to have two voices. One for gathering the sheep and another for warding off and driving away wolves and thieves. So sometimes pastoral leadership is comforting people, drawing them in. Sometimes it's giving a harsh word or rebuke. Sometimes it's telling somebody you're not welcome here because you're teaching something contrary to the scriptures. Well, let me just wrap up with this. I've got a couple of points, two points of application, and I'll make these very, very quickly, and we'll be done. Number one, will you pray for your pastors? Let me just ask you to do that. Will you pray for your pastors? Yes, pray for everybody, but pray for your pastors here. Pray for us to be faithful shepherds who wisely lead God's people. Um, let me suggest a good way for you to pray for us is to read the qualifications here in Titus 1, 5 through 9, and 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Read through both those lists and pray for Chris and myself that we will be faithful men who will reflect these biblical qualifications. And let me just add, be patient with us. We're not perfect. We have our shortcomings. Uh, we need your love. We need your prayer. We need your patience. Number two. Will you examine your own life this morning? Will you examine your own life this morning? And what I mean by that is we tend to look at these biblical requirements of elders and conclude that they must be, man, they must be super saints in order to be pastors. Right? That that's, must be what it takes. But if you'll notice here, many of the requirements of an elder, they're just basic Christian moral standards. That's all they are. In other words, this is how all Christians are supposed to live. D.A. Carson said it really best. He said the most remarkable thing about the biblical qualification for elders and deacons is that they are unremarkable. I think that's he's right. So ask yourself this morning, does your life reflect these qualities? Are you quick-tempered? Are you given to drunkenness or addictions of various kinds? Are you a, a violent person? Uh, are you faithful in marriage? On the positive side, are you hospitable? Do you love what is good? Do you live a, a self-control, a, a disciplined life? How do you need to grow in these areas? Are there any areas of your life that you've just roped off from Jesus and said, you know what? You can have me in all these ways, but not in this one area. Does it need to be, is there something in your life that needs to be brought 